Welcome to the Plan Air Podcast from Plan Air Magazine. I'm your host, Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. This is episode number 13, and this week, because I'm heading out to the Plan Air Convention in Tucson, I was unable to get an interview done. But I happen to have been interviewed for a podcast by Danny Grant on the podcast called The Studio. And I thought I'd share that interview where you can learn a little bit about what it is I do. In the Plein Air podcast, we dive into the world of outdoor painting called Plein Air Painting. For those of you who don't know, Plein Air in French essentially means in the open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plein Air, others pronounce it Plain Air. But no matter what you call it, there's a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is all about the movement, the painters, the collectors, the galleries and the art. This week's podcast is brought to you by Lilladal Art Instruction Videos. It's my desire to see more people fall in love with plein air painting, and you can help by sharing this podcast with your friends on social media or on email, and I hope you'll subscribe as it comes to you every week. And if you have feedback, just contact me, Eric, at plenairmagazine.com. Today's interview brought to you by easelbrushclip.com. Now, here's the interview that Danny Grant conducted with me on a podcast called The Studio. Eric Rhodes, welcome to The Studio. Hey, thanks, Danny. Or is it Daniel? What do I call you, Danny or Daniel? Uh, Danny will be fine. Thank you. Well, you know, your website says Daniel. I I know. (laughs) I know. I'm trying to look very professional. Yeah, well, you do. You look very professional. You're a rock star painter. Oh, well, thank you. Um, Well, so I wanted to start with... Um, you, the recent honor you received by the Florence Academy at an event in New York City, and you were honored along with Kip Forbes, Judy Kudlow, Jacob Collins, Daniel Graves, and Stone Roberts. So can you tell us a little bit about that event and what that award meant to you? Well, I, you know, there are so many, many deserving people. Um, From what they told me when they called me and said, Hey, we're going to honor you. I said, well, why me? And they said, well, you know, you've done a bunch of stuff and we think it's cool. And I said, well, you know, there are a lot of other people that probably are more deserving that started early on. I I think it was really, first off, it was about someone who's promoting, I guess you could call it academic realism, um, you know, Mm -hmm. because of the magazines and so on. But, um, it was a beautiful event. You know, Florence Academy um, just did a, a really great job. It was held at a, a really beautiful venue, and uh, it was beautifully lit, and the the, ven- the the event was just first class. I go to a lot of black tie events in New York City that are put on by a lot of uh, people that I do business with, advertisers and, and so on, and, and, you know, they pull out all the stops and, and do some really incredible things, and the Florence Academy event, was right up there in terms of holding its own. It was, you know, they had a live orchestra and the yeah. tables were beautifully decorated and the uh, the people came in costumes. Uh, a lot of people came in costumes. I didn't, my, um, I looked like I was in costume because I looked like, a, <laughs> I, was, I looked like a penguin. But, uh, it, you know, it was really a first class event and, and a, I applaud the Florence Academy. Why they picked me, I really don't know. But, you know, they're... Uh, oh, that's not oh, true. No, no, really, I, I mean... Seriously, there are a lot of people who were way ahead of me who were very much well, involved wait, in I mean, the whole uh, in the whole thing, and so you know I'm kind of a late. Well, so what did they say? I mean, they must have they must have uh, you know given you an introduction and said, "Hey, this is why we're giving this is why we're honoring Eric Rhodes tonight." Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I guess I'm a little uncomfortable talking about that. It it. You know, okay, it's, all right. let, let's just say that they did it and it was really, really nice. You know, I, I wasn't really sure what to expect because I've I've only been honored uh, once before in my career. I got a, a broadcast pioneer award a few years ago and it it was kind of weird. You know, it's kind of weird when they're up there talking about you and uh, you're standing there in front of all these people. And uh, it it's just it. it you know, it's like, wow, I did that stuff. That's cool. And, you know, you just, you, you just do what you do. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's right. nice. To, it's nice. But I, I, quite frankly, I was a little taken aback. It was, you know, I kind of had to hold back the tears a little bit. It was like, wow, finally, yeah, some, sure. finally some recognition. That's pretty cool. And cool. so that it was really sweet. 
Well, so we could get into, I mean, if people don't know, so you're the, um, you're the publisher of fine art connoisseur magazine and plain air magazine. And, um, you're doing a million other things. And I'm sure that obviously this is where, you know, this is where that award comes from. Um, all of the work that you've done and promoting, uh, you know, you write a great piece at, um, in, in every issue of fine art connoisseur at the, you know, in your little, um, what is it? The publisher's message? What's it called? I don't know. Publisher's notes okay. or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all, it's always really good. And, and you talk about, you know, um, you talk about why it's important, why this kind of artwork is important. And, uh, and obviously you're, you know, you're promoting that kind of work in your magazine. So it is really important work that you've done. Um, well, I think Dan, what, what you know, if, if, if you go back to the very early stages, um, there was a magazine called classical realism journal. Uh -huh. And, um, when, when I kind of first discovered painting, I discovered this, this journal and it, it didn't have very many subscribers and it, it wasn't really done very well, but it was, it was okay. But the content was fabulous in terms of the stories. And they were talking about, you know, some of the um, kind of early stage atelier type people like, um, oh, I don't know, I don't want to get into names, but it it, it was good. And uh -huh. when I finally kind of found myself uh, stumbling into all of this, uh, which we can get into, uh, I, yeah. I, I saw that what these um, these artists were doing, some of them a lot younger, some of them my age, some of them doing some really amazing things to kind of bring back uh, classical realism, if you will, or postmodern. What, what's what's the term? Graydon Parish uses uh, uh, po post contemporary. Post contemporary, and so I wanted to kind of get behind that and promote it because I thought it was something worthy of promoting. And um, you know, I'm not a real modern art geek, and uh, I don't really claim to understand it or appreciate it. I don't want to slam it in the early stages of the magazine. I kind of, I kind of, uh, made a mistake. Actually. Um, I wrote this scathing editorial about modern art mm -hmm. and I did it because someone we all know and love kind of encouraged me to go really bold. And I did, and I kind of did it against my better judgment. In other words, I kind of got led into yeah. it. And, um, I immediately got a call from the president of Sotheby's who said, we're canceling all of our advertising because oh we, we can't be seen uh, as someone who supports one type of art, but not another. We have to be open mm -hmm. to everything and we're canceling our advertising. And, and you know, the, nothing we could do ever changed that. And we lost a lot of money on that deal. Um, and, and at the same time, I kind of felt like, yeah, well, you know, I said what really needed to be said. And so, hey, if I lost an advertiser over it, you know, I, I guess if, if they weren't uh, willing to stick with that, I, you know, I can understand their perspective, but I had to be able to say what I needed to say. So it was, but I, but I was a little bit probably bold. I, I think, you know, the, the thing I don't want to do is do what everybody else did. And that is that when uh, when modernism came around, everybody was kind of oh this is bad and they poo pooed it and you know it's, mm -hmm. it's and I I think you know the reality is that we need to be inclusive we need to just say look we have our niche you know we have people who love what we do and uh, why should we badmouth anything else it doesn't do any good to badmouth anybody you know most of us don't right. you know most of us who do what we do don't necessarily love or appreciate uh, or even in some cases understand what, uh, you know, what others are trying to do in the, in what I call squirt gun art world. But, uh, but at, at the same time, I, you know, I don't think it's necessary to badmouth it in the beginning. I kind of thought it was, but I've kind of backed off on that because I don't want people badmouthing us. I mean, you know, that's part of the problem is that they look at what we do and they say, you know, these people are Cretans, they're, you know, they're going to the past. And that's not really true. I mean, we're, we're using techniques that are rooted in the past that are, right. that are good techniques that you can measure, but, uh, that's where it stops. Yeah. I, I think it's, I would much rather, I, I don't quite see the value in spending a lot of time bashing 
other stuff that you don't do. I think, I think you're right. I think, um, well, really there's room for everybody. And so it doesn't make, I don't know. I just don't want to spend a lot of time. I don't see where it gets us to spend a lot of time bashing the other thing because it's not like, it's not as if you're going to just change a bunch of minds and all of a sudden the art market is going to just go, oh my gosh, you're right. right. The, what, the, what have we been doing the, all this time? Clouds are good. Yeah, the, you guys are doing this. The clouds are going to part and the angels are going right. to sing. It's it. not, oh! yeah, I, yeah, I think that, you know, if you put, if you put it in perspective uh, like music, first off, um, you know, I, I love classical music and I love opera uh, but I also love rock and roll I love uh, yeah. I, I love triple um, um, I love you know a lot of different kinds of music and I have my moods when I'm in the mood for one and I have moods when I'm in the mood for another and I think for somebody to say well you know uh, the world is going to return to classical music and everybody's going to embrace classical music and and everybody who doesn't like classical music is an idiot. I, I, you know, it's like saying the same thing. And so I think if you think of it in those terms, I mean, I know people who are um, very wealthy collectors who have everything. Uh, they'll have mm -hmm. a, you know, apartment in New York, and maybe their apartment in New York has something uh, very conservative, and they'll have something in, a, in their home in Aspen, uh, Colorado, that has cowboy art, and they'll have something in their home in Miami that has something, you know, bright and colorful. A and, you know, they're kind of trying to fit the mood of where they live and what they have. And, and so I don't want to be the guy who accuses people of being cretins because they don't do what we do. I, I think, you know, we just need to allow people to appreciate and love what they love and and we need to do what we we need to do and you know there's this this sense of that we who are of this academic realism world are underappreciated and unnoticed and we're not getting the values uh and we're not part of the the big art machine um i think you got to be careful what you ask for because the big art machine is in fact that and Though, you know, if, if, say, for instance, the work that you're doing or the work that Jacob is doing or, you know, any of the of the the brilliant artists of our time are doing, you know, suddenly the giant prices and the pressure to do more and more hit and we got to we got to get more and more output. And, you know, you've got these uh, these these major uh, market maker galleries who are saying, look, you know, you you need to produce 50 of these or a hundred of these or 500 of these a year. You need a factory. Right. You know, that's one of the reasons that some of the modern art can get, can do what they do. I mean, you look at, at right. some of the people like, uh, like Damien Hurst or others who, who have uh, crafts people working for them, who he comes mm -hmm. up with concepts and then they, they implement those concepts and they can crank it out and they can sell a lot of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's at least what I've heard. I don't know if that's entirely true, but I, I think that, um, look, there are people who appreciate what we do and we need to promote it. Uh, we can promote it more, uh, but not at the expense of anything else. Yeah. I think, I think that's a good point that you make about the sort of factory made, um, art because that might be something that most people don't take into account when we're looking at the two sort of, um, like the classical art market versus the, um, modern art market, I guess is they work in a very different way than we work. We can't, most of us can't produce that quickly just because of the nature of the work that we do. And so, you know, like Graydon was on, on my last episode and I really connected with, with the way that he says he works because he works very slowly, like many of us do. And so he's found these collectors um, who just appreciate work that's done well and crafted well and and a lot of time and, and love has gone into it. And so he's just found these private um, collectors who appreciate that and taken himself out of the gallery scene. And now, you know, I think the gallery scene is obviously still a huge part of our world and it's going to be probably for a long time and, and it is important. Um, but I think that's a great thing is that basically we need to just kind of find 
our thing and not scream and cry about what's going on in the larger art market. Um, because there are, there are galleries that are catering to what we do and there are collectors out there and, and we just need to find those people. And it's not, um, well, one of the things that I think is really important, I'm sorry to step on you there. No, no, you no. know, the, <clears throat> the, there is a huge, uh, importance in quality. Um, it, it is abs right. absolutely critical. We, we are being judged every day and, and there is the cycle that is going in our favor. Um, there, uh, there's something when I first launched fine art connoisseur, I laid out in, in one of the articles, uh, some research that, um, Greg Hedberg had done and he had, shown that there were cycles in art um, that basically cycled between um, a modern and non-modern, modern and traditional every year. Uh, not every year, every hundred years or every 80 years. And then I found a book from a, a guys by the name of Strauss and Howe called Generations. And they, ta they tracked uh, generational trends from about the 1400s. And uh, oh, wow. basically what they said is that the Pendulum swings the opposite direction every hundred years, and and I laid down uh, next to their chart. I laid down what Hedberg had done, and Hedberg's was every eighty years. Theirs was every hundred years, but it was very clear they were totally in sync. And what mm -hmm. was happening is that art through history went from a modern era to a traditional era based on what was happening in this, in the psyche of individuals. And we are going through a cycle right now. Uh, you know, Carva Caravaggio was a modern artist uh, back in those days. I mean, we don't look at him as one, but he was, he was considered radical and modern. And, and, yeah. and so we're going through that cycle and we're moving into a generation now uh, that is moving towards more traditional things. Now, you know, uh, whether or not the, the impact of the internet and the way things move, you know, those cycles may shorten because things move a lot faster than they did, you know, um, back in the 1400s or even back in the 1960s for that matter. But, uh, you oh, know, yeah. the, they say that the, the trends last a hundred years roughly. And then we start seeing, seeing, you know, a, a crack in the armor and the light coming through and a, a new era emerging. And that's, I think, what's happening in our world is that younger people, somebody who's 25 today looks at what their parents like or what their grandparents liked. And, you know, that's old stuff. Just like when I looked at what my parents liked, it's like I didn't want that in my life. And right. they probably did the same of what their parents liked, you know, and that goes into, mm -hmm. you know, everything. It goes into what they use for media, what they watch on television, what or, or what they use to entertain themselves. Comedy goes through these these eras. Books go through these eras, film and television. And they're all very reflective of certain points. Uh, there's a really great book to read called Pendulum by um, Roy Williams and Michael, uh, oh, Michael, forgive me. I'm sorry, I'll think of it. Anyway, um, uh, the, the book Pendulum talks about this swing of uh, every hundred years, and it talks about the, the things that you can see as triggers of a generation. Well, what we have right now is we have um, a lot of 20-year-olds, lots of them. There's probably 2,500, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 of them who are studying in ateliers, which are all offspring ateliers from people like Jacob and Dan Graves. And, mm -hmm. and now, you know, there's a second and almost a third generation of these people. And when I started Fine Art Connoisseur, I don't think there were five places that I, I could find in America or really in the world where yeah. you could really study and learn. And these ateliers were were relative, what, what, relative. When did you start Fine Art Connoisseur? What year was oh, that? Oh, I was afraid you were going to ask me that. I, <laughs> well, I think it's. I think it was a uh, uh, dozen years ago, maybe 12, 12 okay. years ago. I'm not sure. And, yeah, I mean, but that was that was the beginning of a lot of this scene, though. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there were people doing it, but you know, the the one common thing I constantly hear is I hear people who are in their 60s or even 70s who or 80s who say. You know, when I got into art, it was all modern. I couldn't find anybody to do to you yeah. know, to do traditional training. When I first started painting, uh, I first started training 
a painting when I was 40. My my yeah. Freudian slip. I started to say my mother. Uh, my wife, <laughs> my <laughs> wife bought me um, an art lesson. I hope she listens to. Yeah, this. she won't. Uh, she thinks I'm nuts. Uh, so the she bought me an art lesson in, in, at the Armory Art Center in West Palm Beach, and I went into this, and the guy said, "Just slap the paint on there and express yourself and use big, broad, sweeping <laughs> movements." And I said, "Yeah, but like, can you teach me how to paint?" a bottle or uh, some flowers or something. Uh -huh. I really would like to do that. He said, oh, no, no, that's nobody does that anymore. That's old school. And except he didn't use the word old school because they weren't using that at the time. But the, <laughs> the, uh, and I said, well, you know, uh, this isn't what's in my heart. This is what I, I, I don't want to do. He says, well, you'll never make a living as an artist if you, you know, you want to do that other stuff. I said, I don't want to make a living as an artist. I have a living. Mm -hmm. I want to just, I want to learn to paint that. And I got right. so frustrated with it, I quit the class. So, um, but, but that, you know, there's so many people who had that kind of experience. Uh, my own brother wanted to go to art school and, you know, they were pushing modernism on him and he became a modernist, um, and he's a very good artist, but, the, but the, the point being that, you know, it was not easily available. And, and quite frankly, even college kids today who are going into art school oh, yeah. and the art yeah. art schools at most universities are a sh are, are a shamble and and they should be ashamed mm -hmm. of what they're teaching. I don't mind them teaching uh, that stuff, but they need to be teaching the you know the essentials, the core essentials. I well, I a, yeah, but they they do take that view, that very antagonistic view that that what we do is not important yeah. and that and yeah yeah and 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 I had a neighbor, a young lady who uh, had just graduated from the University of Texas and she got her her MFA. And I said, well, you know, show me some of your work. She said, well, I don't really have anything that I'm proud of. And she <laughs> said, you know, basically, I spent four years doing collages. Yeah. And I said, well, what about the drawing? And she said, well, they never taught us how to draw. And and so I hooked her up with Graydon, and, and she started studying with Graydon. She's an extremely talented young lady. So, But the, she she said, I don't even know where to look for this stuff. And I think that, that yeah. you know people will stumble into it if they know what to look for, but if they don't know what to look for, it's hard. And so part of the... Yeah, there has to be some entry point. You know, right. if they're, yeah. So part of what we have to do as a, uh, a group of people, I started to say an industry, but that word doesn't really fit. You know, mm -hmm. ARC, Fred Ross and, and Kara Ross yeah. uh, have done a magnificent job um, in, in a lot of ways. And they're doing some mm -hmm. things now. They've started the Da Vinci uh, Society, which is teaching school teachers how to teach this kind of art and get the, you know, the beginnings going. And that's going to have a phenomenal impact. But unless you stumble into something like that, you still don't know. And so I've got this vision for how we can reach um, literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of high school art students and college, you know, before they get into college and help them get exposed to uh, this uh, this kind of art again. Let them pick and choose what really speaks to their own hearts. But if they're looking for this and they don't know how to find it, it's not easy to find. And I, I'm not going to get into what yeah. that vision is right now because it, oh, I was just going to ask. Well, it's it's related to uh, an event. Let's just put it that way, and I'll, I'll leave it at that for now because I don't want to blow the idea and talk about something that I'm not sure I can pull <laughs> off. But okay. it. Um, you know, my vision is to get uh, 100,000 art students from across America into a major football stadium together and bring in the top artists in the world to inspire them. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a means of how to do it. I have a friend who's doing it in science, and he said he'd teach me how he, how, how he did it. And oh, wow. so, I, I, you know, it's a big thing, and it's going to cost millions of dollars, and I don't know where I'm going to get the money, quite frankly. So I have to figure out how to do it. But I, I, I want to change the art world because um, I think that what we're doing is worthy. And I think that there are tens of thousands of young people who would love to learn this, as evidenced by the fact that we've got all these young people who are studying in all these ateliers now. And it was um, Andy Warhol who said that if a hundred, just a hundred art students move in a completely different direction, it will eventually change the world. Well, you think mm -hmm. about those hundred art students that studied under, um, you know, people like Jacob and people like Daniel and some of the others out there, and I'm sure I'm 
forgetting people I should be including. But now those people have ateliers of their own and they're training right. students and look at what's happening. And, you know, and, and, and as this thing blossoms and those students start training students and so on and so on. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that what will happen is that in, in, I told, I was with um, Josh LaRock and Michael Klein, Michael, um, and I mm -hmm. were talking about this. And I said, I think that you guys, by the time you're my age, your paintings will be selling for millions of dollars and you will be considered some of the great masters of, of all time because... Well, why do you think? Because this is going to oh, blossom. Sorry. This is catching on fire, and, and yeah, but do you, do you really think our paintings are going to be selling for mi for millions of dollars? Well, not, I mean, not, I hope so, but not yours. Certainly not yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Just, well, just kidding. no, I do. No. I, I do, and I think so because I think that. <laughs> well, my paintings are only twelve by sixteen, mostly well, somewhere around million. there. Okay. So, well, yeah. but I think the point being yeah. that. 800,000. You know, part of it is wishful thinking, of course, but I, I think that first off, you've got some... Well, I just, I I mean, I know that there's like, it, there's that market in the modern, in the modern space, and it's so inflated because of all of these different things. Um, and so I just wonder, like, is that it's so puffed up and it's so inflated and it's so beyond like what the real, what the rest of the art market is. I mean, we see this, these, uh, you know, whatever, a canvas painted all black and it sells at Sotheby's or one of these auction houses for, you know, $5 million. And we all go, Oh my gosh, that's so ridiculous and horrible. Um, it, but that seems like such an outlier. Like the rest of the art world doesn't look like that. And so I just I, I'm not suggesting that that's going to get replaced, and and I don't I, yeah. I I don't want to go down that road. I you know I stood at Sotheby's in the press block looking at the audience when a uh, I think it was a Rauschenberg went up, and and I watched you know people's little fingers going up. I watched them drive that thing up to I think it was seventy five or eighty million dollars in in the course it of does. about thirty seconds. And, yeah. and it was phenomenal. And, you know, that stuff is all very collectible and very important in the art world. And I'm not suggesting that goes away. But I am suggesting that um, what what is happening now is reflecting the sensitivities of a new generation. You know, when you look at, you know, J Jacob is is not necessarily of that new generation. Jacob's probably 50 years old. Um, but you look at Josh LaRock, who is probably... 25 or 30 or 30, 33, somewhere in that area. I don't, you, yeah. know, you know, you look at you and, and you're probably in that age range. And I think that what you guys are doing is you're painting what you're responding to and you're doing it in a modern way. In other words, you're, you're using classical techniques, but you're doing uh, things that don't necessarily have to look like they were subjects from a hundred years ago. They look like they're right. subjects. I mean, uh, if, if you look at Josh LaRock just submitted a thing for the P BP portrait of his wife and you know, it's a modern hairstyle and modern clothes and yet it's a very classical mm -hmm. pose and those kinds of things are going to resonate with that, with that generation, I believe. And, and the reason that generation is interested in painting it, that generation's peers will probably follow that. So when they, come into money and when they come into the ability to collect at a high level, you know, when they're, you know, they're, um, 20, 30 years down the road, I think that that's going to be inflated. I, that's just my gut. I also think that, yeah. that there are, well, I hope you're right. I also think that there are some, some very strong efforts going towards, uh, that direction. You know, uh, if, if I'm able to pull off, uh, what I want to pull off, if Fred Ross is pulling off some of the things he wants to pull off and others, you know, th then there are some, some things that, that are going to help drive the awareness. You know, you can't mm -hmm. necessarily make somebody adopt something that they don't like, but you can, you can drive awareness. You know, that's what marketing's all about. It's, it's about driving awareness and then people make a choice. Mm -hmm. And if it's something that they like, that, then they'll pay for it. You know, but I, I don't think this really should be about what sells. I, and and I'm a marketing guy. I teach marketing. I love to help artists understand how to sell paintings. And that's really important. But this has got to be bigger than that. So what's really critically important and the thing that is on my mind right now is that um, 
artists like Josh or like you uh, or people of that generation, um, Scott Waddell, et cetera, they need to be painting monumental paintings. They need to be painting, you know, six foot, 10 foot, 12 foot paintings with multiple figures that will end up in museums. That's what they've mm -hmm. got to figure out how to find time to do. And, and the challenge is how do you find time to do that and still make a living because those, those paintings may not sell. I mean, you look at Max Ginsburg, most of Max Ginsburg's work is designed to be going into museums after his death. And he told, right. he told me that, you know, yeah. His, yeah. his goal is to paint, um, uh, social realism commentaries about life in America and reflect life in America, uh, the way it was during his lifetime. And his hope is that those will end up in museums. You know, it's not about how much sells today. Now, may, maybe Max is in a position where he doesn't have to do as much selling. I don't know. But I think that, you know, what's really critically important is that this hundred year period of time is that we're doing work that's going to end up in museums. And so what I want to encourage artists to do is is to make sure that they're doing that is, you know, yes, you have to output things for your galleries, but you know, you need to have, even if it takes you two, three, four, five years, you need to have a major piece that you're working on at all times that when you, you know, once in a while, when you're bored with doing a still life or doing a figure or something that, that you're outputting for a yeah. gallery, do a major piece so that, you, you know, you look at the major pieces the artists throughout history did in their lifetimes and, and how important those are and how they're in museums all over the world and we want to be a part of that. This generation needs to be focusing on, on their legacy as well as, you know, yes, we want to make livings. And, and, and I can show them how to do that. And I can show them how to sell paintings. But we, we have to make sure the quality is excellent. And there are painters today, I honestly believe, who are every bit as good as the best painters throughout history. I'm seeing yeah, people knock it out of the park time and time and time again. I mean, and, and you look at, at, at people like Graydon and people like Jacob, um, you know, they're, they're just absolutely phenomenal painters. And, and those things, though they're being collected by wealthy collectors, those things are going to end up either in family collections or and probably more likely those families will, will build museums, you know, from their collections, as many people have done throughout history. So that, I think that, you know, you've got to think short term and long term. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry about the rant. No, no, it's great. That's yeah, that's really good. Um, well, let's get back. Let me get back to you. Um, oh, enough, so you en mentioned enough about me. Let's talk about me for a while. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, no, we we haven't talked about you. Um, so you mentioned starting painting at forty. Um, I mean, I so I know about your career, but why? Why 40? Why Why not 40? Well, why not 17? Why not 25? Um, you started your, your career in radio, right? I did, yeah. I was 14 years old when I went on the radio. Okay, so you were on the radio in, instead of drawing. Well, when I was a kid, my mom, uh, my mom is an, uh, was an artist, a hobby artist, and mm -hmm. uh, she was taking a lot of classes. I grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and she was taking a lot of classes uh, I don't know. It's something that she attended YMCA or something, I suppose. And, and mm -hmm. she was doing a lot of still lifes and actually I've got a couple of them. They're very good. I was actually surprised. Uh, I, at the time I didn't know. And, um, and so I would paint stuff with her when I was a kid. I remember I used to paint rocks. I'd go out and, mm -hmm. and buy acrylic paint and I'd paint rocks. And then I, you know, I'd paint on the rock paint, or paint yeah, pictures paint, of rocks. I painted on the rocks, not Okay. Not pictures of rocks. Yeah. I saw a, a phenomenal painting of rocks when I was in Cuba. It was as good as anything I'd ever seen, and I'm kicking myself for not buying it. Uh, <laughs> still, I'm, I'm going to go back to Cuba next year. I'm going to take a group back there next year. I, I hope it's still there. I'm going to go buy it. A anyway, uh, so I, I was painting with my mom, and I remember um, in fourth grade there was this kid named Ricky something, and I, I don't remember his last name, but he had a drawing book. Um, and I and he was drawing characters, Disney characters and things. And I wished I had that. And I always dreamed that one day I would grow up to be mm -hmm. an artist. And I was always doodling and drawing 
figures, uh, mostly actually portraits, um, and they weren't very good. And I always thought, you know, one day I'll I'll kind of learn how to do this. And yeah. and then you know the influences of my dad, who was an entrepreneur, kind of kicked in, and I I definitely got that gene. And yeah, so I kind of became an entrepreneur. And but you know what happens to people is they go through life, and then they wake up one day and they they say, gee, you know, I'm working an awful lot, and and uh, I need to have a little fun too. And, and mm -hmm. so at about 40, I, I actually pulled out some paints and I, um, uh, I had recently gotten married and, and, um, uh, Lori was encouraging me to paint. So I went out and bought some paints and I was copying pictures and I could not figure out how to make the paints work properly. And I was, uh, painting this one painting and I I remember I still have the painting it doesn't have a head on it I painted the body but I didn't paint the head couldn't figure out how to paint the face yeah. and so she said well I'll buy you a lesson and she bought me that lesson and it was that crazy man no. and so um, so did you start painting first before you got into um, publishing in the art world or w which one came first? Well, so I had, I had pursued this career in radio. I became a radio DJ and I absolutely became obsessed with and loved radio. I still do. Mm -hmm. And are there, are there any audio clips of you on the radio anywhere? Yeah, there's a, there's a thing called real radio, R E E L. Oh, awesome. Real radio.com. And there's a bunch of my old air, they call them air checks. Um, yeah, I was a top 40 so, disc jockey. So, hey, I'm your planner, push it daddy, weather radio, whip, those yeah. wild, wonderful wedges of wax, pounds of sounds and miles of smiles. Awesome. Yeah. So what, okay, what What were some of the names that you were under on on the radio? Um, I started out, my first air name was Dusty Reese. Um, <laughs> and, and the radio station, Why? well, it was a college radio station, and they gave me the name. I said, why are you giving me this name? They said, well, we have a bunch of jingles that we stole from some other radio station, and, <laughs> and they had a guy named Dusty Reese, and you're it. So I was Dusty Reese. Wait, there were already j jingles with the name Dusty Reese in them, well, so they just plugged well, into so them? some station in some other city had jingles, and they had the name Dusty Reese. And this was a college station. They didn't have any money, so they probably... <laughs> you know, they probably took the jingles from some other station somewhere, and, and then we all got a, a radio name. And then uh, then I went on to radio in, in Fort Wayne, and, well, this was in Fort Wayne. I did the college radio, and then I went into a commercial radio station and trying to break in, and, and I wasn't, uh, I was horrible. And uh, so I got a job uh, working at the radio station, sweeping the floors and stuff, and and. Um, one day they said, okay, now you're going to get to do the Sunday morning church tapes. And I got to basically press buttons and I never, uh -huh. and I was so nervous because I remember that I got to do the ID live and, and at the top of every hour, I got to say this, yeah. this is W L Y V Fort Wayne. And I remember I would practice that for hours <laughs> and I still sucked. And then, um, uh, one day I, I was, you know, making some, I, I would make these tapes in the production room in my spare time and practicing DJing. And one of the DJs left there and he said, you know, you're sounding pretty good. And so he took a job in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and he called me one day. He said, they have a weekend opening up here. Why don't you come? And so I got to be a weekend DJ on the radio in Kalamazoo at WYYY. And so that was like my my big thing, and I got really good at saying why, uh, w y y y, and and um, and then and I was you know like 16 years old, oh, wow. and um, so I I graduated high school early. I desperately wanted to get into radio, and I sent my tape into somebody, and I got this job at a major market radio station in Miami. I was the youngest, I was told anyway, the youngest full time. Uh, DJ in America. I was, I think I was 17 years old. I'm sure I wasn't the only one, but that's what they told me. And I, so I was on this radio station in Miami <laughs> called Y100 because they liked the way I said why. And <laughs> that kind of launched my radio career. And so I did that for about... Were you still Dusty Reese at that time? Well, I was, um, well, the first, <laughs> the, the, the first program director that hired me at Y100 was a real stoner and um i won't mention his name but 
uh, anyway, he said, you're going to be, your name is going to be him. I said, him? him? That's what well, my reaction is. He says, yeah, you're going to be yeah. him. And uh, so he said, when you're on the radio, you just say, this is him. I said, well, that's grammatically incorrect. He said, exactly. <laughs> and so I was him. And then a new program director, that guy got fired, and a new guy came in. Um, that guy. And he said, you're going to be he. And, uh, yeah, it should have. And he said, well, that's the stupidest name I ever heard. He says, you're going to use your real name. And my real name is Bruce Eric Rhodes. And he said, Bruce doesn't really fit. He said, so you're going to be Eric Rhodes. So that's how I got my name, and so I was Eric Rhodes after that, and still am. Huh. Oh, all right. Uh, so <laughs> a- anyway, so I did the radio thing. Um, and well, you're kind of a natural entrepreneur, right? Oh well, you know, I did the lemonade stand, and I, I, yeah. I did. I started a candle making company when I was about 15, and you know, I just, just always trying to figure out how to how to do stuff, and. And, and that's because my dad, because my dad was an entrepreneur, so it was a natural thing for me. But I, uh, I was in the radio business. I got far enough along that um, I, w- I became a programming consultant, and I would um, make radio stations successful, or at least try to. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I got this station in Provo, Utah, and uh, they and the reason I took it, I had some stations. I had a partner, and we had stations all around America. I think we had about twenty-five stations, and we were, you know, we were building them and making them successful. And, and this guy from Provo, Utah, called and he wanted us to be their consultants. And I, I didn't really want to go to Provo, Utah, because it didn't sound very exciting. But they had a, a license that they were getting ready to put on for Salt Lake City. So we we went there and took that job thinking, well, we'll get the Salt Lake City thing. Mm-hmm. And so I worked a lot with them. And my partner didn't want to go work with them very much because, you know, it was Provo, Utah. And so... Um, that, Sorry to everybody in Provo. Oh, well, no, no, I ended up living there. Um, <laughs> so what, what happened is he came to me and, and we were negotiating the contract and he said to me, you know, I'm not going to give you the Salt Lake Station after all, and I'm not sure you can succeed with it. And I said, well, I'm so confident that I can succeed with it. If you're not going to do this, why don't you let me buy it from you? And he said, okay. And wow. and uh, I said, well, how much? He said, $1.6 million. And I said, okay. And I thought, oh, crap, what do I do now? <laughs> and so I had to scramble and figure out how to get the $1.6 million, and, and that's a whole other story. But uh, and I ended up buying this radio station. And at the same time, I had gone to the FCC and applied for a radio station uh, to put one on the air uh, in a little city outside of New Orleans. And at the same time, I got that license. And so instantly, I ended up with two radio stations, and then I ended up I had the AM, and so I had three radio stations. And and I was completely stupid and young and inexperienced and didn't know what I was doing, and I made a lot of stupid mistakes. And, and But anyway, I, I, I ended up, I sold the radio station uh, right before, I guess when I turned about 30 or 30, 32, I sold the radio stations. I made some money. Um, and then... Uh, I got into another business. I found uh, I was at the state fair and I found this big giant radio that they used for a karaoke booth. And I went to the guy and I said, "Hey, I've got nothing to do, and I think radio stations would buy these. Can you put them on wheels?" And he said, "Yeah." So, <laughs> so I started that business. We sold about six million dollars worth of those, and um, and that started a company. But when I was trying to build it. What did radio stations do with those? Well, they put they took them out and did dances and did their took their DJs oh, okay. out and stuff like that, put them in parades right. and stuff. It was called a giant boombox. You want to Google it? <laughs> and, and so what happened is I was, the trademarked giant boombox. Yeah. So I was trying to figure out how to reach radio stations and 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 I was buying some advertising from some of the trade magazines in the radio business, but there was nothing for managers. And I had been a manager of a radio station. I knew that there was a need. And I, this guy mm-hmm. tried to sell me some ads, and, and he tried to convince me he had people reading it. And, and I bought some ads, and they didn't work, and I was really concerned. And so I wanted to meet with him, and I, I went and met with him in New York. And I walked out owning his magazine. Um, wow. So I, that's how I got into the magazine business. And, and so I changed the name of it 
and I, and I started a magazine called Radio Inc. and it became a top publication in the radio industry. And so that's how I got into publishing. So while I was doing this radio publication, when I started taking art lessons, mm-hmm. and of course okay. you can see the the future of that coming. So I was taking these art right. lessons, and I would take like Tuesdays off and and paint all day Tuesday and or half day Tuesday and half day Saturday. And I studied with this guy. I met by mistake. His name was Jack Jackson. And Jack had studied with uh, Senior Rita Simi uh, at, uh, I think it was the Romanelli Studios. I'm not sure what it was called, uh, in Florence. And, and her father was Frederico Simi, and he studied under Jerome. And, oh, wow. and Simi is the one who taught Dan Graves and uh, a couple of the other guys cool. in Florence. And, um, and my guy was studying with her and then he came from there and he went to study with Ives Gamble and he studied mm-hmm. with Frank Riley. So by the time I found him, he was, he was much older and I studied with him and, and the method that he taught, he said, look, you know, this is a, this was at the Armory Arts Center again in West Palm Beach. And he said, look, I, you know, I have to teach a lot of uh, people, you know, who are, who, who need speed. He said, you know, the proper way for you to do it is to spend five years drawing. He said, but I can't get people to do that. So I'm teaching them a, a sped up method. And so, uh, what we basically did is he taught us a grid system, taught us how to copy and we would copy, uh, old masters paintings. And mm-hmm. so he, we basically did some, you know, pretty rudimentary, rudimentary, root I can't say it uh we 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 would do it in a way that you know you look back on it now and it seems stupid but at the time it seemed I didn't want anything different and so we would literally would trace posters and then we would copy them onto canvas and then we would fill them in and so he taught us how to paint uh and he taught us the Riley palette and so that was and that's when I first started recognizing art again, I hadn't really paid attention to it. I, you know, I always liked art, but I never really paid much attention to it. So I remember we were, he was teaching us how to copy Bougaro's and I, you know, you look at those Bougaro's and you just couldn't understand how Bougaro possibly did it. And yeah. I remember I was on a business trip and I went to the, um, the museum in San Francisco, the palace of the fine arts. And I saw a Bougaro mm-hmm. first time in person and I stood in front of that painting and I wept and it, it, <laughs> I had no idea what was going on, but I realized when I stood there and I looked at the technique that that man had, and I could see the veins under the skin and I could see the transparency of the skin. I could see the monumental size of the painting. I realized what that man went through to create that and to learn how to do that. And I, and and I, I think I wept yeah. because I knew I'd probably never accomplish that, but I also wept yeah. in appreciation. So that's when I all of a sudden changed. That was the turning point. And, and I started, okay. you know, really becoming interested in painting. Now I still wasn't getting that proper instruction, but I was painting as much as I could while running a business. And then mm-hmm. I decided, um, to start an internet radio company. I had lunch with Mark Cuban and Mark, I said, I've, oh, cool. I've got this idea and Mark was, had, had started this company audio net and he hadn't sold it yet. He wasn't famous yet. And, um, uh, I, I said, I've got this idea and he says, well, you need to go out to Silicon Valley and, and get it funded and do something with it. And so I, I, on his urging, I picked up the phone and I called this guy I knew from second grade who was a venture capitalist named Tom Toy. And I called Tom and I said, Hey, I've got this idea. He said, what is it? I told him, he said, hang on. He calls another guy, conferences him in. The guy says, be out here tomorrow. And, and I went out there and I pitched pitched the idea in front of seven people and they gave me $7 million. And I built uh, one of the very first internet radio companies called Radio Central. So I had moved out to San Francisco and I'm still trying to paint and it's not easy because I'm running a company with 50 employees and trying to build it up and everything. Yeah. And, uh, so I left my mentor, Jack, which was really sad. Um, and anyway, I'm not sure where I was going with that, but, oh, I know where I was going. So my, my wife 
and I found out she was pregnant with triplets, and she said to me, you know, you can't paint anymore. You're going to be a dad. You're going to need to be responsible. Oh, no. You know, you're not going to have time. And that really kind of broke my heart. And she said, and you've got to get the smell of paint out of the house. I can't stand the smell. So I decided to take it outdoors. And um, I did not know what plein air painting was. I'd never heard the term plein air painting. And I uh -huh. did remember Monet, you know, having an easel outdoors, but I never really stopped yeah. to think about it. So um, it was, I, I carried my studio easel out onto the golf course in boxes and boxes of stuff <laughs> and a card <laughs> table and a chair. <laughs> and I started, I, I did a painting outside. It was horrible experience because I, you know, it just the light, the wind, yeah. the bugs, you know, everything yeah. it didn't work. And I finally, in a, I was in an art store and I saw something about plein air painting and some kind of a seminar somewhere. And so I went to it and it was from the plein air painters of America. And I went to this thing and, and I started taking some courses. And well, I realized there were a lot of people who were doing this plein air painting. And so I just kept paying attention to it. And I finally, I said, I'm going to start a magazine. I'm in the magazine business. There's no magazine mm -hmm. for plein air painting. So I started plein air magazine and I I tried really, really hard for two or three years, but the advertisers wouldn't support it. I had a lot of subscribers, but I was losing money. I, I was going to go bankrupt. My accountant said, you know, if you don't get rid of this magazine, you're going to go bankrupt. And I was going to lose everything. And I had gone to the art materials people and they said, oh, nobody paints plein air. And, and uh, why would we support something like that? It's too specialized. You know, if you were abroad, we w might, might consider you, but you're too specialized and there's plenty of broad magazines yeah. out there. And the galleries said, well, nobody, nobody buys plein air paintings and why would we advertise? And so I had to, I had to face the choice of either closing it or changing it. So I came up with the name Fine Art Connoisseur, and I changed Plein Air Magazine oh, cool. into Fine Art Connoisseur. And uh, Jennifer, well, the first, let's see, who was the first editor? I think it was Jennifer King. And Jennifer and I had a dispute one day because, uh, there. It, by the way, she was very qualified and very good, and I liked her very much. And we had a dispute one day. And there was a painting that got into the magazine that I didn't think was high enough quality and she thought it was high enough quality. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know what we need is we need a tiebreaker. We need somebody who has the knowledge and could be the tiebreaker. I said, what we need is a curator. And so I was in yeah. New York, I was visiting Howard Ray's and I remember walking from Howard Ray's gallery, uh, walking down whatever street it was, Fifth Avenue or something. And, and, Park, I don't remember what street it was. Anyway, I saw the Dehesh Museum, and I had re, had been to a dinner mm -hmm. at Fred Ross's house, and I had met Peter Trippi. So I thought I'm going to drop in there, and ask him that question: How, who, how do I find somebody like? Yeah. Him? yeah. So I dropped in, and unexpectedly, and I asked to see Peter, and he dropped everything, and he saw me, and he was perfectly delightful. He remembered me, mm -hmm. and I said, "Hey, you know, here's this problem. How do I solve it? How, how can I find somebody to do that?" He said, "Well, you know, I would do that for you." He said, "But." You know, he said, things aren't going very well here at the Dehesh. You know, the board is doing some weird things. And I think this isn't going to last very long. He says, I'm kind of thinking I should move on. And uh, he says, why don't you hire me as your editor? So I did. Cool. And uh, so that's been, you know, I think that's probably been nine or ten years ago. And Peter is just absolutely amazing. I don't. Yeah, Peter's great. I don't mess with anything. You know, he he picks everything. I, you know, once in a while I help him with the covers. Uh, but I've gotten to the point where I don't even do that anymore. I mean, he just, he just does a beautiful job. Yeah. Well, so what is your role right now? Um, are you the CEO? What, I know you're the owner publisher, but what, what do you do kind of day to day? Well, I, you know, I, I mean, I know you're doing a million different things, but as far as like your, your role as in the, uh, with the magazine. Well, my role is to be the conscience of the magazine is to keep everybody mm -hmm. focused on what the right thing is. And, and so if there's any kind of a discussion or dispute, then I have to be that tiebreaker. But, okay. um, the reality is I don't need to, cause Peter and I are perfectly in sync in what we want to do and, and what we believe in and the kind of art that we want to support. And, um, you know, a fine art connoisseur is doing very, very well. It's become very successful. And, you know, what we try to do, our philosophy is that we try not to do what everybody else does. The tendency 
uh, my tendency in the beginning was to play the hits because I came out of radio. Yeah. In radio, you play right. the hits. And so I wanted to put, you know, Van Gogh or Monet on the cover of every issue kind of thing. And, and Peter's like, right. no, 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 that's not interesting. You know, let's, let's do things that everybody else isn't doing. And so we try very hard to feature, you know, artists that are not necessarily being featured elsewhere. We try to dig and find stories that are um, really interesting and, and, and that are not necessarily being profiled everywhere. And um, one of the stories we did one time, we, we were at, um, uh, we had a party we, uh, during the Palm Beach Fine Art Show, one of them. Um, we had this party. We rented out the, the um, Flagler Mansion, and I had this big fine art connoisseur party because uh, we wanted to get tight with the dealers, and the dealers were all there. And mm-hmm. one of the dealers that was there, uh, I think his name is Derek Johns. He's from London. He was looking around on the walls, and he, he spotted a painting, and he took a picture of it, and he discovered that it was an unknown Canaletto. And actually, the Flagler Museum was a little bit not happy about that, I guess. But anyway, it turned out, you know, it was a completely undiscovered painting. So we got the exclusive, got to do the story on that, you know, that kind of thing. We're always, yeah. we're always looking for interesting angles. And, and, you know, there's a lot of things that we could do that we're not doing. But, but we're, we're really trying to be a little bit different, keep it interesting, keep it exciting. And Peter just does a marvelous job. I, I just feel like very blessed to have him. And he's so uh, articulate and, and such a good teacher and so passionate. And, and it just really couldn't be a better match. That's great. Um, so a- as an entrepreneur and, you know, building these businesses, and everything, you become a marketing expert and you're, you're putting out these marketing, uh, DVDs now and they're, they're just excellent. Um, but what, what are some of the things, what are some of the, what's the top advice you can give to artists who, are are struggling in that area. I think a lot of artists have trouble with that. It's not, maybe it doesn't come natural to a lot of us. What are some of the, say, I don't know, top three things that that artists can keep in mind or should be doing uh, in a marketing area? Well, that's a, that's it. it, It's hard to oversimplify something as, as complex as, as marketing. Um, I, I think that, the the most important if there if you could pick a most important thing and that is that um the first thing is is you need to know where you want to go so I, i'll mm-hmm. get calls from artists and they'll say you know i want to i want to build my career and i'll say well what does that mean well i don't know and mm-hmm. and so um when i first started the art marketing um courses that I do every year at the plein air convention. I do, I never repeat the same thing twice. And so I, every year it's all new stuff. And actually this week I'm preparing for next week's plein air convention. And so I've got a whole mm-hmm. bunch of new stuff that I'm doing, cool. including a, I've developed a kind of a do it yourself system that, that I think is going to revolutionize things. But the, I, I think the most important thing is start with the end in mind. And that is, you, you know, what is what is the outcome? What do you want? You got to be careful what you ask for, right? So let me give you an example. Um, Sometimes you don't know what you want until you know what you don't want. Yeah, definitely. Right. So, so one of the best ways to define what you want is defining what you don't want. So like Mm -hmm. in in my particular case, um, I don't want to be away from my kids a lot. I don't want to work for anybody else. Um, I don't want to have the pressure of ever owing anybody any money. I don't want a banker. I don't want a loan. I, you know, I just don't, Mm -hmm. those are things that I don't want. Uh, I don't want to commute back and forth to Hong Kong every month, you know, and and there are lots of things that I just don't want. So when I, uh, when I left that job, uh, so sorry to jump in. So, but so that's kind of, uh, thinking about, maybe thinking about the lifestyle that you want. Well, I think it's, I think lifestyle is absolutely critical because so, yeah. so the point I was going to make is when I left the job in, in, uh, the startup, uh, that, that I did in San Francisco at radio central, um, mm-hmm. they killed the company cause the towers went down and they couldn't get any more money. And it was, yeah. you know, so 
I, I thought, you know, I what I liked about that experience and what I disliked, I disliked the fact that I had a board of directors I had to answer to. I disliked that I owed that that I had to go out and beg people for money. I disliked uh, having a staff that big. I disliked, you know, certain aspects. And so when I got out of that job, it's right when my triplets were born. And so I said, okay, here's what I don't want to do. And so I said, I want to work from home. I don't want to do these things. And I, I basically made a list of what I don't want. And then I said, what do I want my life to be like? And so I said, I sat there and I dreamed a little bit and I said, okay, well, one thing is I, I really love uh, the lake that we go to in the summertime. And I would like to spend all summer there without having to do any business travel. So I said, okay, I want to spend my summers at the lake. I don't, mm -hmm. I want, I don't want to take any meetings. I don't want to do any business travel during that time. I'll work, but I, I don't want to do those things. And so that went on my list. The other is I don't want to be away from my kids all the time. And so I made that on my list. And the other is, you know, I don't want to owe anybody any money. Don't borrow money, et cetera, et cetera. So you get the idea. Yeah. And so I designed what I wanted my life to be. Now, the other thing that I said is I do want, I want to make sure that I go to Europe at least once a year. I do want to make sure that I get enough time where I can go paint landscapes. Uh, and I want to do that. And I do want to make sure that I get time to do uh, portrait work or figurative work. And so I said to myself, okay, how do I do that? Well, I designated, okay, I'm going to take at least two or three weeks a year, and I'm going to focus those two or three weeks on painting trips. But because I can't take two or three weeks off easily, I'm going to make mm -hmm. those business um, trips. And yeah. so I created these painters events so that I would have a good business reason so I could be going out and doing business, but at the same time being with painters. And and then I, you know, I, I have this um, uh, weekly um, portrait group here in Austin. And so, mm -hmm. and that's important to me. And so when I'm in town, I do that every week if, if possible, uh, because that's important to me. And, and then I do the fine art cruise every year uh, in Europe, which is how I figure out how to get to Europe every year. It's just, it's a disciplined thing. So what mm -hmm. you do is you, you figure out what you want and then you figure out how to get there. And so those are the ways that I figured out how to, how to do those things. And so now, you know, I hear people all the time who say, well, you know, wow, you're everywhere, you know, you're doing all this stuff. And, and I, I feel very fortunate because I feel like I'm living my dream and, and, you know, I don't need much more than that. If this is not about money for me, I don't, uh, you know, I want to make a decent living, but I don't need a lot of money. What I need is time with my family. What I need is time yeah. for painting. What I need is making sure that I'm, I'm uh, checking that box in my life and trying to figure out how to be a better painter. And so er everybody needs to do that. So I think the very first place is, you know, people say, well, I want to sell more art. Well, why? Well, I, I need money. Well, what do you need money for? Well, I need money for this and this and this. And, and I get that. But, but, and we all have these obligations that we don't necessarily want to have to deal with, like paying, you know, rent or mortgages or otherwise. And so, you know, you list all that stuff and you list what you've got to have and then you, you know, work backwards from there. But you, mm -hmm. you also got to think about what ultimately do I want to do? Where do I ultimately want to be? And, you know, I, my for me, it wasn't about having, you know, Learjets and mansions and all that kind of stuff. For me, it was about having freedom because mm -hmm. freedom is everything. I tell my kids all the time, look, you can go work for somebody else, but the minute you do, you have no freedom. You know, they're right. going to tell you what weeks you can take off. And, you know, if you can be an entrepreneur and you can start your own business, you know, I went eight years without a paycheck, you know, starting this business. I, you know, I remember, uh, eating peanut butter for a week because I couldn't afford yeah. anything else. But so I made those sacrifices to eventually get to where I am now. And, and you make sacrifices, but you, you know, if you have control over your life, if you're, you're, you know, that's the nice thing about being a painter is that you can have control over your life to a certain extent. Yeah. You have partnerships with galleries. Um, but, you know, ultimately, if you can figure out how to do that, I talked to a very brilliant artist recently, and it was a heartbreaking story because, you know, he is not spending his time doing his art. He's got a family. He's got a, you know, wife and family and kids to support. 
And so he's taken another job and he doesn't like mm. his job. And, you know, he makes it an OK living with that job. But every day he wishes he was painting. And he's yeah. like, well, I'm going to paint when I'm 65. And I said, yeah, but what if you don't make it to 65? You won't have done it. Yeah. You know, you got to find a way to do what's in your heart, because if you don't, you're going to look back with regret. You know, I look back and regret because there's a lot of time that I wasted and a lot of things that I did that I wish I hadn't done. But there are also things I had to do to be able to make a living. And, and to, you know, there was a lot of struggle and there was a lot of hard work and, a, you know, a lot of 20, 25 hour days, it seemed like. And, and yeah. I, I mean, I remember when I was younger starting my business, I'd sometimes, you know, go home and sleep for two hours and get back. And, and uh, it just, you know, it's you do what you have to do. Right. Um, so a typical day in the life of Eric Rhodes, you've got, well, I guess first tell us, I've mentioned a few of the things, but I know there's, there's a lot of other things that you've got going on. Um, so I guess we'll go through all the things you're, <laughs> all the balls you have up in the air. Um, and then I'd like to hear about a, a typical day in the life of Eric Rhodes and how you juggle all of that. Um, you know, just what's, what's your basic schedule like from day to day? Well, the, you know, there are a lot of, I, I, uh, Success Magazine did something on their website recently about me, and they called me the shiny object king. Ooh. And um, that's not necessarily a flattering term. Uh, <laughs> hey, you know, I, yeah. I, I probably am ADD or ADHD. Um, you know, I, one of the things that has been uh, good and bad in my career is that it's like squirrel. Right. You yeah. know, you're just like, you see something and you go, Oh, I could do that. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm always, my eyes are always open for, you know, what would be a cool thing to do next. And, you know, somebody contacted me yesterday about something they wanted me to get involved with. And, and it, it, it was like, wow, I, I should do this. And then I caught myself and thought, wait a minute, you know, you got plenty to do already, but that's my disease. Right. right. As I'm always on to, on to other things. So uh, on, I've got two, two things going on really is that um, I've got the radio side because I still love radio and I'm still passionate about it. I still am um, uh, pretty uh, well versed on the industry and, mm -hmm. and I have a trade magazine that I started 20, 25 years ago called Radio Inc. And that has lots of tentacles to it. Um, mm -hmm. So like Radio Inc. has a daily website, daily news. I don't do that. Um, we have some very qualified people, a great editor who does that. Um, and we have another daily called radio television business report. Um, we have a very qualified editor and team who does that. And then we have five radio conferences that we do. Um, you know, wow. and, and so we got a lot going on and then there's, you know, there's lots of other little pieces here and there for that. And then I started the, the art side of things. And so we started with plein air and then we got fine art connoisseur. And then when I realized plein air movement was blossoming again, and maybe I'd try it again, I, I brought back, um, uh, plein air magazine. It was kind of like classic Coke. A lot of people were kind of <laughs> upset that I took it away yeah. and I felt like maybe the timing was right. So I relaunched it and, uh, you know, the, I, I just got lucky. And, and so we launched the magazine again and we got some advertisers who were interested Plein Air Magazine now is the number one selling art magazine at Barnes & Noble nationally, number one wow, representation of art magazine. And uh, I mean, I don't know how that happened, but we're really, really thrilled about it. Yeah, it's the great. big problem, quite frankly, is you can go into Barnes & Noble and they, they don't have them any. You know, you walk in and they sell out fast and we get, you know, yeah. so we always got to keep up in the orders and they keep selling. And that's really a nice thing. Um, and so... Uh, and, you know, part of the reason plein air is successful is not because of me. It's because, uh, first off, there's a hot movement right now. There's a lot of people out there, but, mm -hmm. but secondly, it's Steve Doherty. I mean, he's just a rock star editor and, and he's so good. And, uh, he was with American artists for 32 years. And then he and I went painting together and they were kind of screwing with him a little bit. And so I said, well, you know, if you ever want to come over and work for me. And so he did. And that was cool. And he's still with us. Cool. So, I mean, he's just a phenomenal editor. Um, 
anyway, so what was the question? Uh, oh, so <laughs> well, well, you've got you got to part of it. You, okay, so these you are got, all, all the balls you have up in the air. So, well, we, you know, um, we have, so how do you handle it? So you know, every brand has its tentacles, right? So Plein Air has yeah. the Plein Air Convention, which is now uh, it's sold out, and it's up to about I think it's like nine or nine hundred fifty people will be there next week in, in wow. Sun. Um, Holy cow, that's awesome. Oh, it's incredible because it's a week of learning and it's a week of partying and playing. And, you know, you get all these people out there and we all go painting to the same place together. And so it's really phenomenal to stand out. You know, we're going to we're taking over old Tucson movie studios and oh, cool. we're going to have some models and old Western stuff. And, and there's going to be a thousand or nine hundred painters out there. Uh, painting in old Tucson together. And this everywhere the eye can see there's painters and, and it's yeah. just so much fun. And then we have all these people on stage and demos and watercolor and oil and pastel. And, you know, we've got, I, I think we've got like 80 hours worth of training. So it's pretty cool. And for the, the amount of money that somebody would spend for a workshop, uh, they could go to the plein air convention instead and get like 60 workshops. So I, we got 70 instructors Holy cow. Yeah, so uh, that takes us, um, it takes six months of my time every year, and it takes yeah. I, most of my staff about eight months. It's a huge undertaking, and, and it's, you know, it's massive, massive to do, hard to do, but it's fun. And um, so then we've got Plein Air Magazine. We have the Plein Air Salon Art Competition, which is really catching on. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, we have Fine Art Connoisseur. We have the Fine Art Cruise. We have a video division. Uh, we have Streamline Art Video. We have, we make all these mm -hmm. videos. And my goal with the videos uh, initially was, I you know, I was like sitting around one time thinking, gee, I wish there was footage of, of Sargent and, uh, or footage of Bouguereau. And so, yeah. I you know, my goal is to really go around and preserve uh, artists and, and really try to get their their techniques, but I want to go beyond that. So I, I, I interview them and I kind of try to find out what's in their head. So we document their techniques, we document what's in their head. And so we, I really love doing that. And, and, you know, so that's really a fun business to be in. And, yeah. uh, what else? I'm sure there's some stuff that I'm missing, but, um, so what's a typical day for me? Like, well, I, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's get into the, Minutia is it's kind of my signature question, I guess. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure anybody cares. <laughs> well, I care. I don't know why. It's interesting to me. I don't know why, but um, well, what time do you get up? I, 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 you know, I know a little bit about you. So you, you generally get up and take the kids to school, work out. Is that part of your yeah. routine? Yeah, I, I wake up at 6:45 every morning. I wake up the kids. I make them breakfast. I get them off to school. Uh, and when when they get on the bus, or if I have to drop them off, then I go to the gym. I work out for an hour every morning. And, and this is important. Um, every morning when I'm on uh, the elliptical or the treadmill or whatever, I'm listening and learning. So I buy everything I can get my hands on to educate myself. I listen to podcasts. I I listen to uh, I watch videotapes. I buy lots and lots of videotapes on marketing, so that I'm always making sure I'm sharpening my my knife. Um, I'm just constantly curious. I try to every morning spend at least an hour learning, and then when I get I I get back to the house when I shower. I, I have a wireless speaker in my bathroom and I'm listening to tapes while I'm getting ready in the morning. And it really helps set my head for the day. Yeah. It helps me come up with creative ideas and I'm learning constantly and everybody needs to be learning constantly. Yeah. Um, I bought recently, I bought Sabin Howard's um, webinar on, um, on the structure of the head. And so I've been watching that on the treadmill. Um, I down, oh, cool. downloaded it and have been watching it. And so I'm, you know, I'm constantly learning. And if I'm on an airplane, I'm, I'm, if I'm not doing work, I'm learning, uh, because I, I think that's really, first off, I'm curious and I, and I'm excited. Um, so I get up in the morning, I go to work, I work from home. I'm very fortunate to be able to do that. My company is essentially virtual, uh, I think we have almost 60 employees now and, uh, cool. but it's a lot different than it was before. Cause I work from home. I'm not managing them and most of them are self-managed. Most of them work out of their homes. We have a, 
small group of people at our office in Florida. We have, you know, six or eight people there and that's where accounting is and fulfillment and things like that. So that's where they send the videotapes out. And of course you can get the videotapes online too. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, I don't know. I put my feet up on my desk and, um, and play all day. <laughs> I, no, I don't. I, um, you know, my day is, is pretty tightly scheduled. My assistant, Allie, who's a rock star is, absolutely amazing. And I don't know how I could survive without her. And she kind of keeps the wolves away. And, and what I mean by that is yeah. that, you know, when you, when you have a lot of visibility in two different industries, you get, you get, I, I get probably 15, 1800 emails a day and a plus, you know, plus spam. And so, <laughs> you know, she sorts through all my emails and things that I don't need to deal with that can be forwarded. You know, we get a lot of press releases. Hey, look at my art kind of things. Typically, she forwards that to right. our editors and things like that. So she kind of cleans out my inbox. She deals with a lot of it. And then I, you know, I get um, the rest of it, which is still, you know, 500 pieces a day. So I spend a lot of my day on email. I try, uh, I'm trying um, to, to meditate every day. I try to do it before I start in the morning for 20 minutes because there's so what's your, what's your method? Well, I was trained in transcendental meditation uh, oh. years ago, but I, uh, and I use that method, but I, um, you know, it's not a, in, the, in that particular case, it's not a, um, anything more than meditation. It's not a, a, I'm not doing it right. for, for spiritual reasons. Right. I'm doing it because there's so much freaking stress that yeah. I've got to be able to deal yeah. with it. It's the stress of having three 14 year olds who are absolutely, a, <laughs> you know, a barrel of monkeys and they're a lot of fun. It's the stress of running a household and the stress of, uh, knowing that if you screw up, you've got 60 employees who are going to lose their jobs. And, and then there's all the stuff and all the deadlines. You know, I, I write columns for, um, for Radio Inc. every issue. I write blogs for Radio Inc. all the time. I write columns on art marketing. I write columns for Fine Art Connoisseur. I write columns for Plan Air. I write my, you know, I've got my, did I mention my art marketing blog? And, and, yeah. and then... Which is great, by the way. I love that. Thank you. And 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 then there's just, you know, you've, you've got to deal with the financial aspects. And so it's, you know, I spend a lot of my day um, juggling meetings. And then I try to find quiet time. Um, there was a study done recently on billionaires and I thought, well, you know, that'd be nice. I kind of like to do that. I'd like to be one of those. And so yeah. not that I really want the headaches that go with it, but I said that billionaires do a couple of things consistently. And that and one thing is that they spend uh, about an hour every day just thinking. And yeah. that I, you know, my meditation kind of does that for me, uh, because a lot of things, even though I'm meditating, a lot of ideas and things pop up and, and I try to remember them and I do try to spend some thinking time and I try to play a little bit. So, you know, when I'm stressed out or I, I, uh, I'm on email or, you know, I'm just feeling a little, uh, just, you know, working too hard. I pick up my guitar and I play my guitar for five or 10 minutes and it gets my juices flowing again, or I'll walk over to the house, and yeah, cool. walk over to my studio and look at my paintings and see, you know, how I can improve them. And, and, you know, just, uh, you know, you got to get away once in a while. You've got to, you yeah. know, so, but it's, it's fun for me. And, and the thing that's most fun for me is writing. I love to write. I love to write, um, stories and copy. And so I try to find a lot of time to write. And so I spend, I spend a, a big part of my time writing. And then, you know, you're dealing with, um, employees. And fortunately, um, I've got a team that I just, uh, I, you know, they would, they would die for me. I mean, they're just really wonderful people and I'm so fortunate to have them. And, and, you know, I've got some really, really killer managers. Um, they are, you know, and they handle a lot of the details and a lot of the stuff so that I can be truly an entrepreneur. I, you know, I'd like to, yeah. I'd like to figure out how to get them to handle more things, but, um, <laughs> you know, they, you know, they just make my life easier. I mean, my assistant, Allie handles most of the details for the plein air convention. She, along with Tom Elmo, who's my COO who has been with me for 24, 25 years. And, you know, they, those two do 
most of the details. But then, you know, I've got an entire marketing team now. I used to do all the marketing myself, and I just, we grew too fast. We became an Inc. 500, 5,000 company last year, which means you're oh, awesome. one of the fastest growing companies in America. Uh, yeah. and, and everybody says, oh, so you're rich. And no, I'm not <laughs> rich. And I keep telling the employees, you know, this just is talking about growth. It doesn't mean we have any money. Right. But uh, <laughs> but so, you know, it's slow down on all the raise requests. But when you grow fast, then and all of a sudden you realize you've got a lot more to do. And so, you know, we, yeah. we keep adding to the team and and we just hired two new people last week. And you know, we're producing two videos a month and we're, you know, we just got a lot going on. And so it's just constant flow of, of, um, editorial and marketing materials and ideas. And then, you know, the other thing is you want to keep in touch with people. So I spend a lot of time with people, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the phone and emailing and, you know, because uh, that, people are what this is all about as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, it's, it's not fun if, you know, when you're working from home, you know, you get a little lonely. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So I, you know, I have to, like yesterday, I was just, I just had to talk to somebody. So I picked up the phone and called one of my buddies. And um, so that's what I do. Cool. Well, awesome. Well, thanks, Eric. It's been, it's been really great having you on the show. Appreciate it. So you never talk about yourself. Why don't you do that? Why don't you interview yourself? Hey, let, let, I'll tell uh, you what. Let's do it. We'll do an interview <laughs> right now. Dan, how long have you been painting? Oh, are we? Come on. Uh, well, I I talk a little bit about. Uh, so t- you you went to Jacob Collins. You, were you at, at uh, Grand Central or? Uh, I started at Water Street when when that was still happening on uh, 69th Street. Yeah. And what do you what do you like to paint? <laughs> uh, I like unicorns and flowers. <laughs> um uh, you probably, know, I don't probably know. Probably do. I do. Yeah. Well, I I think that, you know, I first off I've been listening to your podcast and I like it very much and and uh um I think you're really 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 exceptionally good painter and um a real sleeper. Uh, and what I mean by that is I think that, um, you're, you're going to get discovered, um, because I, I know you're pretty humble and you're, you're not very good at blowing your own horn, which is evidenced by unicorns and candy canes, rainbows, <laughs> but, um, you know, you're really a good painter and, and, uh, oh, thanks. and I, I wish I could paint like you could paint, you know, that's, that's my, the next thing that I'm trying to figure out how to conquer is how do I get better at painting and i oh that's what okay all right i was i was gonna wrap up but that you led into one question that i had here and that is if you could spend a month if you could move an artist into your house and wake up every morning and walk into the studio with that artist and learn from that artist every day for a month who would that be oh man i'm gonna like irritate like (laughs) all right well give me give me I don't, you know, give me the first three, four that come to mind. I, I you know, uh, the problem is if I mention any names, I'm going to make somebody mad. I, I oh, so I, I have two, two primary goals. Um, one is that I want to become a better landscape painter. And two is I want to become a better portrait or figurative painter. Um, and it's hard to do anything well when you're doing lots of different things, I think, but I'm, you know, I get bored easily. Um, (laughs) so if I could move an artist into my house for a month, um, oh man, there's so many, or or how about, how about somebody in history? We'll make it, uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be diplomatic. Well, I, someone who's dead. Monstead, um, Peter Monstead. I, I love, his work, you know, it's, it's, uh, it looks tight, but it's not really very tight when you look at it up close. Have you, have you seen him in person? Yeah, I have. And there's a, there's a guy, um, who's going to be at the, the next year's convention who I can't tell you right now because I'd have to kill you. But, um, I think he's the closest thing. He's from Europe. Uh, I think he's Uh the closest thing to, to Monstead that I've seen. I think that, you know, if I could study with Joe McGurl, I love 
Joe McGurl's yeah. work. I, I, um, I also like Eric Koppel's work. We do an Eric Koppel uh, video and we've just, yeah, it, those videos are really good by the just way. released a second one. Um, so I think if I could, you, you know, I'm, I, I think that I, I, you know, my problem is I like different kinds of paintings. Like I'm in love with Russian paintings and if I could study with, with Repin, um, you know, I've got a lot of friends in Russia who are artists that I, that I'm tight with and I'd love to spend time with. As a matter of fact, I was going to take a group over to Russia and then relations got a little bit tight. So I canceled, but <laughs> Well, it can't be any worse than Cuba. You went to Cuba. Oh yeah, we went to Cuba. That was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna do another another Cuba trip for artists uh, in I think in January. So yeah. the um, I think you know I also love people who have that kind of really great loose spirited plein air kind of thing. You know, like like um, I like Brian Bloods work a lot. We did a video with him. And, you know, the nice thing for me is that I, I don't always attend all the video shoots, but I try to. And so I get to, yeah. to spend time. We uh, recently shot one with Ryan Brown and uh, that's coming out. We re recently shot one ju with Juliet Aristides. And, um, and of course, Dan Graves. I'd love to study with Dan Graves. I'd love to, you know, go to the Florence Academy and, and learn. I'd love to study with Jacob. I'd like to spend a week or a month with, um, with Jeremy Lipking. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean, there's just so many really yeah. good paintings, you know, uh, Josh LaRock or Michael Klein, or, I mean, you, I mean, you know, there's just a lot of people. Uh, uh, I don't want you moving into my house though. <laughs> um, and, and then, um, I'll just pitch a tent in the backyard. Yeah. You won't even know I'm there. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, if you're yeah. willing to do that, I think that, that works too. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think that, you know, the big challenge for me is that, I love what I do so much that I I don't really want to sacrifice that for painting. I think that I I will have a bit, bit bigger and better chance of changing the art world by doing what I'm doing rather than painting. You know, I don't have these grand visions of becoming a a well-known famous painter. I guess I probably pretend that I, I Well, but I know that you love it. Well, so. I I'm, I'm totally passionate about it and and you know, it's like a day without painting is like a day without oxygen. And so, yeah, I absolutely love it. And, and my big frustration is that I don't get to paint in the daytime very often because of the demands of family uh, and the demands of work. But, you know, I'm out there not every night, but I'm out there most nights. The, the frustrating thing is, you know, I don't sometimes don't get out till the kids are in bed, which is 930 or 10 o'clock. And then. Yeah. And, you know, then I'm not very clear thinking I'm tired, but I, you know, sometimes yeah, I'll hard. paint till two o'clock in the morning and. And then, you know, come in, get some sleep and go to work in the morning. So, but I got to paint and I try to carry paints with me, if nothing else, even some watercolors when I travel on business. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I, I do these, these two weeks a year. Well, it was two weeks a year. I do this thing called Publishers Invitational in the Adirondacks where I get a hundred or so painters and we just paint for a week. And then I, I decided to do it in Maine because it would be cool to paint in the fall color of Maine. So I do this yeah. called fall color week in Maine. And then. And then this Cuba stuff started coming up. I thought, well, we better get into Cuba before it changes. And so I, uh, it was tough to get us every, everybody in because we weren't actually allowed in there yet. So I got, I took a hundred painters to Cuba in February, and it was historic because it's never happened before. And we painted and doc. You floated everyone over on rafts and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> it was pretty interesting. And then I'm going to announce a uh, another exotic trip. Uh, at the plein air convention next Ooh. week and it's it's going to blow everybody away it's absolutely phenomenal and i can only take people right. i can only take 50 on that one but it, you know it's it's a lot of fun to do this because i get to spend a lot of time with other people and and i'm you know my wife is kind of a um she gets her energy by nesting and i get i'm the opposite i get my energy by being around mm -hmm. other people so you yeah. know i i'm very social i'd rather be around other people so anyway, I I, uh, I digress, and you can end this thing. <laughs> uh, that was awesome. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Danny. It's been a pleasure. We'll talk to you soon. I hope so. Well, that was the interview conducted by Danny Grant on his podcast called The Studio, which you can find in the iTunes podcast section. The interview was sponsored by easelbrushclip.com, a cool tool. Everybody seems to be picking one up to put on their easels and hold their brushes. 
You can watch a video at www.easelbrushclip.com. Podcast episode number 13 brought to you by Lilladol. Art instruction videos, over 100 videos and artists to choose from at lilyartvideo.com. Well, I'm heading out to the Plain Air Convention this week. It's going to be fun. Looking forward to seeing all of you there. It's a big, giant party. <laughs> the Plein Air movement is hot. It's red hot, and that may be why Plein Air magazine is so hot. On the newsstands, number one representational art magazine sold nationwide at Barnes & Noble. So drop by, pick one up, or we'd love for you to get a subscription. comes out bi-monthly for about half the price of the newsstands. You can do it at pleinairmagazine.com. Well, it's always fun. Thanks. Let's do it again sometime. I'll see you at the convention. And then we'll get another one of these done next week. See you then. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine. Remember, it's a very big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye.